actually going to do a Q&A and a uh, 10 minute Q&A with Francis Anderton and then we'll open up to the audience for additional questions. Okay. So how are you doing, Ian? Fine. <laughs> I, I'm, honestly, I'm so impressed. I think you must be bionic. The flight from London to LA is not a, a pleasant one. What is it, 12 hours or something? Mm. So, um, but I suppose the seat's more comfortable on Virgin. Certainly is. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> and it's Virgin. been quite a marathon talk. Really, really interesting. And I hope you're still feeling energized and ready for a little bit more and do have some questions at the ready because obviously Ian touches on such a confluence of of uh, connected and disconnected themes that it raises a lot of questions. Um, I think primarily, just to s get us started. Um, I'm change the slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's advertising, which is not so hot. That's better. <laughs> this is a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, it would be nice if we could be sitting in that conversation yes. seat. Yes. But. Um, but watching you talk, I was fascinated actually to hear a little bit more about you, as in you really occupy quite a sort of maverick um, position, part artist, part philosopher, part architect, part engineer, part inventor, part commentator on, on global issues, and so on and so forth. One, I'd like to know how you can function as all of those professionally, but two, how did you become that? I mean. What kind of education do you have? Where, where did you get your start on this path? Uh, I started in medical school. In medical school? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it lasted eight weeks and it was like going back to school. It was horrible. <laughs> um, that was in London. And then I decided to go to Liverpool because the Beatles had just left and it was a lively city. And I met poets. And I mentioned that earlier. The Beatles were poets too. Um, some of them were. <laughs> um, I think the, the significant moves were, in my career, were going to France to build a house quite innocently, a decision taken in 24 hours, and suddenly huge responsibility because one had to deliver the house. There was nobody to pass the drill to. And the house was with a girlfriend, but for another lady. Yeah, for a couple. Right. Yeah. And they were retiring farmers. So they have the tradition, Catholic tradition, that the farmer may have moved his farm for better land, and the wife just gets whatever the farmhouse is. But when he came to retirement, he promised his wife a house. So she got the house with him, attached. And <laughs> I remember going over there with a, a model. That was the girlfriend? The, with the girlfriend, yes. Um, taking this model, and they noticed that the garage was all glass. Um, and I explained how the doors were one third pivot so that they could never open the doors of the car in the garage and hit the glass walls. But I explained also that the garage was a thermal buffer to the north. But I think that when building that house, a number of people came up which was significant to, in a way, see how we were getting on. And they came up from Paris where, and they were people like Richard Rogers and Alan Stanton, uh, Peter Rice, people who were working on the Centre Pompidou. They were in a pressure cooker in Paris. I was in my mini pressure cooker on a farm with no culture, no books, and a drill. And, <laughs> and bankers coming around because they had, they had a mortgage, the couple. So they were coming around looking at this monkey frame thinking this can't be real but I grew up and and I, they let you experiment they it was the it was seminal in the sense first project the client trusted me 100% and I was a hippie I had long hair ponytail you know beard works <laughs> and it was a it was seminal because trust is the one thing that probably is the most damaging part of any project any architect works on. There's a triangle, I often refer to it. You have a client, let's call it the builders, industry, and the, and the design team. The lines that connect those people are the lines of trust. If one of them breaks, you're in the shit. 
on the project. The project goes bad. So it's up to the architect often to spot if one of the trust lines is weakening and to do some, you know, medical aid, I guess. With your eight weeks of medical training, yes. I'm sure you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, but in terms of the way you work, it seems as if you stake out some of the place of the triangle within yourself because you're architect and you're engineer, you're sort of, you've, 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 you, we, 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 the professions are, set, are somewhat segregated, if not very well, segregated, it seems. How do you manage to function as... Well, if they're only segregated in some parts of the world, the Swiss don't segregate. Okay. I think there's... I was once asked by a, a British government minister, why does the public not like architecture or architects? This is 20 years ago. And I said, 1834. Yes, he, he went like that. <laughs> it's a test. And it was when the Royal Institute of British Architects was established. And mm. they separated themselves off almost like a union from the engineers. And the reason they did it was because the engineers were doing all the great projects. They were building the railway stations, the bridges, right. and they needed a lobby group. So instead of working with the engineers, they decided to go alone. And so in many ways, the design apartheid that was created by institutionalizing is something I've never really subscribed to. So I'm a free agent in that sense. And you've been, which is highly appealing in a lot of ways, but you've been able to function in that way despite the system. Yeah, I'm a member yeah. of the RIBA. Right. <laughs> you know, okay, I pay my dues. <laughs> now, you've worked a lot in France where there is a sort of a strong emphasis on engineering, isn't there, and an architecture sort of derived from engineering. I mean, tell, you, tell, tell us, you, you started with the house project in the 70s, but you subsequently spent a lot of time in France and did a lot of work yeah. in France. Was there something that's particularly um, um, uh, uh, simpatico, I suppose, about your approach and France? I think, I think the French one was the... A, I learned to speak French, and the French are great because they would talk bad English to you. Germans speak very good English, and they, it's quite interesting culturally. But because I spoke very good French, I was adopted much more easily. But the secret behind my working in France at the government level on the Grand Projet of Paris, whether it's working with Pay on the pyramids and the sculpture courts or La Défense, was the airport, was primarily due to Peter Rice, the engineer, because he was the engineer of the Centre Pompidou. And he, after Pompidou, set up with Renzo Piano, Piano Rice. That didn't work out. And at that time, I was working in Ovar and Partners, Lightweight Structures Group, which was led by Peter Rice. So he was an architect working in lightweight structures. And he was asked by the French bureaucrats to get involved at La Villette. And he asked me if I'd join him. So I then had, apart from the experience of working in Arab, I then had 10 years working with one of the great engineers of the 20th century. And I was going to bring up Peter Rice, the late Peter Rice, yeah. who's, who tra tragically passed away much too young. But he really, in a way, was the sort of seminal engineer of the 1980s, wasn't mm. he? I mean, he's behind all of the great projects, and particularly the projects of you, the sort of what we call, I suppose, high-tech projects that uh, emerged in, in Europe, would you say? He was one of them. Yeah. There were others before him, but there was a tradition in England, it goes back to the Industrial Revolution, the problem we have now, if you like, at one level, that there's a very strong tradition, a strong history, a lineage of great engineers um, working with metal, I think. And what was fascinating was that Peter um, was the only engineer genuinely I felt comfortable with, because he when we used to go to Paris twice a week, we'd meet. And when he'd finished the racing pages, the horse racing, then we could talk. But we would talk about poets, writers, film. We wouldn't talk about work. And he had a breadth and a depth which was so enjoyable. And I think it's one of the great tragedies of engineering education, that engineers are taught to focus. And rather than become generous, broad-minded, human beings who are great to talk about a project with, but when you want to have a coffee, there's kind of no conversation. And I think that's a tragedy. Do you think that's something to do with the engineering is taught these days? Yes. But I think it's, 
The idea that the engineer is a servant to the architect comes from the education of engineers. When we do a project and we know we're going to build it, and I know that we're going to try and do it, we don't sit down as a group of architects unless we have the entire team we're going to work with together at the very beginning. Because if they're at the beginning of the design ideas, the concepts, they feel party to it. If they come in a month later, they have the servant role. And therefore, you don't get the best out of the engineers. They don't feel comfortable. And they will just give you the, if you like, the, the physics. And that level of physics, I don't need. I, it's of no interest. I'm interested in the, the much more kind of richer depth of the engineering. So you're doing some of the, because you, you, you said in your, in your lecture that on the whole architects don't really invent, they don't advance the technology. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, look, from the look of all your projects, this is certainly what you're trying to do. Each one is very unique. Each mm -hmm. one is, it seems like you, you are to some extent inventing for each project. And you're doing that in-house or yeah, with a team from outside? I think there's, I, we don't invent for the sake of inventing. I think that's a childish idea. But we treat every single project, every context, client, politics, money, site, the way the wind's blowing or whatever, is unique. You can't have two projects the same. And if you're open-minded, you just want to explore and find out what's the appropriate response to that particular situation. Sometimes it's spatial, sometimes it's material, sometimes it's a methodology that you develop. And one of the things I do enjoy is rewriting the contractual relationship between builders and the design team to reflect what the project is we're actually doing. That often upsets clients because they're suddenly in no man's land. In legal no man's yeah, land. Yeah, but that's not a problem. We don't use lawyers. Mm. I've used a lawyer once in my entire career. You won't be able to build here. There you go. <laughs> I've never been sued, we've never had a claim, and I've used a lawyer once. <laughs> and that wasn't a defender so either. Now, you've, you've talked a lot about the idea of architects having a moral obligation, and you opened mm. by talking about every project needs to have a moral context. And, um, and at one point, you referred to the number of projects that, that got away, the number of projects that you ended up not doing, far mm. outnumbers the number mm. of projects that actually got built. So what are your criteria for what you know, warrants a kind of a moral project? And what are some of the examples okay, of the projects you, that you rejected in the end? OK, one I can mention comfortably now, as there's still some sort of scars, but we were involved, we were brought in a bit like Red Adair, again, on a one and a half billion pound, so it's a two billion dollar project in West London, where the client with uh, an American architect, RTKL, and a British architect, Benoit, had produced a scheme that upset the planners, upset the for local... For a shopping centre? Yeah. Upset the local community, upset the government office for London, and that was after three years of work. And I was rung up by the client and interviewed. And at the end of the interview, they said, well, would you like the job? And I said, hmm, I need to think about this. Can I have a fortnight? Now, most architects would have been clambering across the table, saying, Mwah, got a big one, you know, got a great job. And there I was walking away, not walking away, but actually being, needing time to understand the implications. And of, of working with consumerism? Well, shopping. working with consumerism, shop, we all need to shop, but the nature of what shopping could be was interesting. Could it move on? And the client came down to see us about 10 days later. And I said, I have two questions. If you can answer either of them, you, can, you don't need us. Now, that's a very arrogant approach, a bit. But the questions weren't architectural. They were strategic about investment. And I thought they'd missed a trick. So I asked them the first question, and they hadn't thought about it. Which was? they needed to buy a bit more land to turn the project into a real urban project hmm. because they were stuck on a boundary where they had no access to the town. And that meant engaging with London Underground, not an easy client to deal with. And they saw the picture straight away and hired us. And what in, was the second question? I didn't, never asked it. Oh. Didn't need to. <laughs> we had the job. <laughs> and on interesting terms. But what was interesting is that when I raised the question of what is the future of shopping, 
I managed to get a university in Paris and a friend of mine to do his research project with his students in parallel with me asking this question of this client. And they said, well, what do you mean? Sort of, you know, what, like Nike Town in New York had just opened. You mean what the designers of Nike Town did? And I said, no. It's what Gen Code, for example, might be doing now. They're the people who invented the barcode. Okay, this is going back some ways, but um, what are they doing now? What's the managing director of IBM Europe thinking about? Where, where are they at? That was the sort of questioning. Coupled with the whole environmental approach, no air conditioned mouths. We'll put a tent up if they need it to keep the rain off. We want to feel the sun, see the sun, hear the rain. Okay, it's nice to shop when it's dry. Public squares that link in. The market, the Afro-Caribbean market in Goldhawk Road could come into the scheme Tuesday. So all these conversations. And my client was bought for two billion pounds. Not the site, my client was bought. And we were on site coming out of the ground with it. In fact, the main cores were up. So another company came and took over the An project. An Australian company that is all over America called Westfield. Mm. And I was now back 20 years with the dinosaurs and an ethos that was completely different. They wanted to seal the mouths, seal the streets, get rid of the public squares, so I resigned. And they took me to a number of dinners in Mayfair. And I was never allowed to go with anybody, always on my own. It's quite pre pressure, because I was a little firm of architects in the east end of London between them and a two billion pound project. And they needed me to get through the planning and I wasn't going to play ball. And they thought, with 10 million pounds worth of fees to come, he'll play ball. But we resigned. <laughs> and they built a load of shit. Sorry. And you feel OK. It's being recorded. <laughs> they built a really terrible scheme. <laughs> terrible project. Terrible. Now, early on, say with the, the, the project in France in the 70s, and you talked about you arrived at this, you know, perfect little gem of technological invention um, and, uh, and um, pa pa you know, all sorts of e energy conser conserving mm. um, strategies. Yet, to accomplish all that, things were ferried all over Europe, it sounds, from Ireland yeah. to Holland to Germany to Paris. Would you do that now? I mean, is it possible well, now to sort of... It, it's very interesting. The, at the time in 19, whenever I designed, 1975, 76, um, it's a 3,000 square foot house that weighs three tons. So it's 10 kilos, 20, whatever it is, you can work it out, yeah? Not much. They had 30,000 pounds, $45,000 for this house. So you get pretty creative. One lorry only mm. went on the journey from the solar panels in Northern Ireland to France. Would I do it again? Or in terms of an approach, are we going to have to be more regionalist if well, we're going to really get serious well, about Well, the conserving? nice thing was that we, he grew, the inside of his house is grown from linen flax, which he grew in his fields. Now, we had those panels made. They were then on the market for two years. People didn't buy them, and yet they had fantastic fire resistance, good acoustic properties, and that was developed on one house, tiny house in the middle of nowhere in France. So, yeah, it's a steel frame. Would I do it with timber? Probably. Today? Probably. Um, but I also had to be able to build it I, to save the money. And I was comfortable. Every element was manhandleable by one person. So there are a number of rules that were appropriate. That's beautiful. It's just, that's just more the question of to what extent we're going to have to move towards, I guess, sort of localizing. Um, all that we do, but I think we should open it up to the floor now. We're getting, um, yep. keeping you up and everybody else here. So, um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, one over there. Do we have a mic? Do we have a mic? Oh, why don't... That might be a bit of a hassle. The mic's coming to you. Oh, 
Sorry, I couldn't see you. You couldn't, see, you couldn't see, oh. <laughs> wrong way. Okay, now you can hear me. Um, yes. I wanted to say I'm amazed by your simplicity, and I don't have an architectural background. Um, it inspires me, and I'm wondering what, it's a two-part question, what inspires you, and if you can go again and talk about the beginning um, of the process of designing, you mentioned poetry and some other things. Yeah. Um, let me just start answering that fairly quickly. I'll read you the poem of that. And that happened, as I say, it's somebody, somebody, no, somebody asked me to do a theatre. It's the pictures of the Royal Shakespeare Company Theatre. And when we finished it, I thought it was a magical thing. We actually did it in a year, a thousand seat theatre from beginning to end for less than six million quid. It was just mind boggling. Nobody ever sort of seen it. And it was a rare example of maybe 30 or 40 different people getting involved, trusting each other. The board of the Royal Shakespeare Company trusted me when I said, I think we could do it for under six million, and the artistic director, Michael Boyd, you can have your theater in a year. Now, it's a huge gamble, but the chairman of the RSC was also a gambler. He likes horses. I wanted to capture that moment, and I went and asked the deputy chairman of the RSC, who has a country house, could I go to their house for a week and write the book? of the story of doing the theater. Whilst I was there, I would wander around the grounds. And I noticed there was a beautiful panoramic view from the southwest corner, but there was no seat. And knowing that there were old people, I could sit on the grass, but they were in their 80s. And I thought, it'd be nice to have a seat. So I left a note saying, thank you for the house and the writing week. Would you like a seat here? And drew a little map and left them the poem. Um, and it went like this. The ebb and flow of life, we seem to move in circles, sometimes incomplete. In silent thought, an unexpected view becomes panoramic. Lost in dreams, an invisible bird sings for me as the mist lifts. Sunrise, sunset, moon, beyond a curved branch, a leaf falls nearby. Sinuous form of life unfolding within the mind across a landscape. Reclining twice placed upon the grass together or sometimes alone. Thoughts construct a seat at a specific place under a white moon. Rolled silvery steel, hardwood touching softness, caressing the light. So what inspired me at that moment was having to walk, saw a wonderful panorama across southern England thought it'd be nice if they had a nice seat where they can talk together. And they said yes. So I made it. <laughs> Sounds mad, but it's... <laughs> so I, I hope it answers your question. Sort of. <laughs> so any other questions? The answer yes. is nature inspires me. Over here. There we go. Hi, uh, my name is Chris and I'm an aerospace engineer and I'm given to understand that you've worked with a broad number of people from different disciplines in your career and I'm interested to hear your ideas on how you get people uh, or to spur collaboration between different people of different disciplines or how you okay. maybe gather a team when you put together a project and get it started. Um, 20 years ago, I was asked a similar question. And I was a lot younger and I hadn't done so many things. Um, but I did a live performance with two friends. One was Catherine Gustafsson, the landscape artist. She now lives back up in Washington, uh, near Seattle. Um, and Pippo Leone, who teaches in France, he was the one who did the study for me, who did maths and philosophy, I think somewhere, Harvard, Columbia, complete madman. We ended up deciding at an arts festival to do a live performance, unrehearsed, of what collaboration means. And we had a beginning, one sentence, and we had an end. 
and we spent 25 minutes on the stage. I was scared stiff. But what emerged were 10 commandments of collaboration. The first one is the most important. Arrive with no preconception. If you're going into a meeting and somebody's preconceived what it is you're going to do, your contribution is already tamed. So one of the things I try to do, and I do work um, not just with engineers, with poets, artists, musicians, depending on the project. Because if you put two engineers together, they'll talk engineering. Or golf or something. <laughs> but you put you know, a painter, a writer, a politician, an economist, historian, there's no chance of a common commonality, if you like, at the beginning. And it's that richness that evolves and creates the new ideas. It's the brassage, this exchange and the brushing up against people. And yeah, an aeronautical engineer, we had two on our spire. We have mass dampers hanging in the middle of it at 70 meters and 90 meters, and they're still connected to motion engineering in Canada, all the computer fallout, you know. So we know, you know, the fatigue rate of the spire under wind in Ireland. And we brought them in at the beginning. We said wind will be the issue. And I think, I don't know if it's answered it, but I wrote a book and there's a copy lurking somewhere and in it there are the Ten Commandments. There's a whole section on collaboration and how we do it. The lady over here. The other thing, just to answer your question, just sorry. Nobody owns the project. It's a shared ownership. Which is why we don't go around the planet saying, aren't we clever? Because we do it with lots of other people. It's a shared adventure. Nobody owns it. It's not, it's not your project, it's not mine. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, I work in the alternative energy sector. And you know, I come from a place where it's a lot of science and research based, and I see that you have more of an aesthetic perspective and kind of an artistic right brain perspective. Um, and I was thinking specifically about, you know, the vertical farm and the future of sustainability in cities. And I was just wondering what your perception about that type of um, concept of living is. I'm, I'm nervous about gimmicks. If I'm, the Americans have a phrase that widget widgeting, widgeting big buildings, you know, they're putting little windmills on, putting up a green facade on one side, multi-level. I, I don't actually like, even in Leipzig, I didn't like the idea of putting trees inside a building. They don't belong in buildings. In the same way, I don't think, you know, 50 meters up, 150 meters up, putting trees or plants on the outside necessarily is a brilliant idea. The idea of cooling a city because you need the vegetation, um, those sorts of things are, if you like, pan-city. They're not sorted by one building. Legislation could change that overnight. Legislation saying what? Well, for example, every driveway has to be a perfect driveway. Every driveway into a private dwelling on all... The, take Los Angeles, okay, from what I saw coming over, my first time here, okay, but having seen the pictures, yeah, beforehand, if every driveway going from the road, we won't get into the road from it, going into the dwelling, into the garage, is a perforate surface, yeah? One move would change the whole climate at ground level where you walk in Los Angeles. One move. And if you then took the front garden and grew vegetables, which you then sold in your garage, instead of having a car park there, then you'd be in a real... So what do you want to go up doing multi-story stuff? What's like? gained by having the perfect driveway? Perforate. Oh, perforate. Sorry, not perfect. Oh, I thought it was perfect. Perforate perfect to rain. The rain oh, can right, go into right, the right, ground. Right. Yeah. So you can still have it hard, but it's perforate. Right. That is a problem in LA for sure. So, so sorry, I'm not answering your question. No, you, you absolutely are. I'm just okay. wondering in terms of feasibility and affordability, how, how do people go about doing that and affording it as well? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a cultural shift that's required. And if you take a community in Los Angeles, I don't know Los Angeles at all, but let's just assume you took a, a one kilometer square and said there's a community there. They probably have enough land amongst their grounds to grow all the vegetables they need, all the fruit, 
have a common store, sell it to each other, share cars, bicycles. So you could, you know, I don't know what it is, that's 2,000 communities in Los Angeles, all operating, sharing, exchanging. And what have you done? You've just, instead of planting roses or clip, clipping privet hedges, you've planted vegetables and some flowers, of course, make it nice, yeah. make it smell good. Doesn't sound very complicated to me, but it's, I'm not one who's promoting the idea that you can change the world culturally. That's the most difficult thing on the planet, for us not particularly. But I think if there was an impending problem of, you know, we know there's food shortages in the world now. Food prices are rising exponentially. Yeah? Sooner or later, people will be growing their own food in the city. Now, Los Angeles is brilliant for it. I mean, I don't know what it was. Ten years ago, you couldn't breathe in this city. Time of the Olympics, 84, was it? I can't remember. It's got cleaned Some, up. Yeah. yeah. Overnight legislation, stuff it. Car manufacturers, sort yourself out. Los Angeles just did it. It could do other things. It could get perforate. It could use rainwater properly. It could grow things properly. Now, do you have to legislate? I don't know. Perhaps you do. But I wouldn't do multi-story high-rise pretending I can plant gardens up there. Who's going to maintain them? <laughs> okay, guys, I wanted to, sorry, stop the Q&A because I know you guys are probably hungry and there's a lot of food out there. So um, I want you guys to eat a lot. Uh, and all of it is actually, you cannot be, you cannot accuse us of greenwashing because we've listed all the sources. All local, organic, eat up. And actually, for those of you who are architecture students, and maybe even John Mutlow will let some other students come in, Ian is going to be actually talking to some of the students tomorrow afternoon at the architecture school. So if you wanted to actually come and continue to ask him some questions, I think that we would probably let you come. Okay, so just come and find out. Thank you very, very much for coming this evening. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and go outside and eat. <laughs>